Bom dia, bom dia, professor Marco Lorbe, bom dia a todos e a todas. Eu queria fazer uma rápida introdução à palestra, enfim, à conferência. É, enfim, além de professor de Princeton, hoje é, o professor Marco Lorbe passou por diversas instituições acadêmicas. Ele lidera uma iniciativa extremamente importante, que é o Painel Internacional para o Progresso Social. Esse é um painel que reúne acadêmicos de diversas áreas, da sociologia, da ciência política, da economia. É uma iniciativa transdisciplinar que vem fazendo esforços é, importantes de pesquisa e formulação para tratar a agenda do desenvolvimento social e da redução das desigualdades. É, ele lançou, com outros autores, em 2018, um livro que ainda não está traduzido para o português, então já fica a dica para as editoras no Brasil. É, não sei se isso já está em negociação é, com alguém, mas é um manifesto para progresso, é, ideias para uma sociedade melhor. É, eu acho que, como já foi dito aqui na, na introdução, é, eu queria frisar alguns pontos que me parecem importantes é, e fase dessa conferência um momento extremamente oportuno. Acho que, em primeiro lugar, os temas de justiça social, redução das desigualdades, sobretudo quando associados à democracia, dialogam hoje de maneira muito crítica com a agenda pública brasileira. Então, acho que para a gente é extremamente importante, relevante e profundamente inspirador ouvir sobre esses temas todos associados. Acho que em todo o trabalho desse grupo de pesquisadores tem um elemento que me parece também fundamental, que é a ideia de que sim, é preciso ter uma visão, acreditar, quando a gente tem uma formulação de que é possível ter uma sociedade melhor, às vezes é difícil acreditar nisso, esse é um debate que não é de hoje, mas é muito importante reafirmar isso a todo momento. Mas mais do que uma visão, é, o que a gente aprende a partir desse trabalho é que é preciso também ter ferramentas, ter instrumentos, você ter um caminho muito concreto para chegar a isso. E, nesse sentido, um outro ponto que me parece importante é como este trabalho que foi sendo desenvolvido pelo professor Flor Bé e o, e, o, e o grupo de pesquisadores é o papel da universidade, da pesquisa, da formulação, como a academia tem um papel, sim, na formulação de políticas públicas. A gente vem fazendo um debate público no Brasil que não necessariamente está amparado pelas evidências. Então, pensar uma agenda de transformação, uma agenda de redução das desigualdades a partir da produção científica, a partir da produção acadêmica, me parece também fundamental. E queria chamar a atenção também para o caráter oportuno de estar tendo essa discussão a partir é, dessas pesquisas, dessas formulações, num seminário que reúne esforços numa instituição acadêmica, da sociedade civil, porque esse é um elemento que também aparece nos trabalhos do professor Marco Lorbeck, que é como diversos atores da sociedade têm, sim, responsabilidade, têm entradas e possibilidades de intervenções diferentes, intervenções diferentes quando a gente está falando da transformação social, da redução das desigualdades. Então, com isso, deixo vocês para a conferência. Muito obrigada. Ok, so I first would like to thank the organizers and this institution, INSPIR, the Foundation Chile Setúbal, and, um, uh, and um, the, um, uh, the UNESCO in Brazil for organizing this, this event, and not just thanking uh, for having the occasion to Uh, to present this work to you, but also congratulating the organizers for choosing this topic, um, which is not just topical nowadays in Brazil, but also <laughs> courageous, I would say. Um, so what I will do is to um, present uh, thoughts coming from this uh, group, uh, the International Panel on Social Progress, which has worked for uh, five years now um, and has produced a report and a manifesto. Um, I may not have the time to talk about a few other things, uh, but I will mention that later. Uh, there are some uh, interesting thoughts that have been uh, brought forward in our group on how to think about the future of Latin American welfare policies taking inspirations possibly from uh, social democratic uh, models, especially what happens in Scandinavia. So there are interesting things there. I probably I won't have the time to, uh, to go into the details, but um, I, I, I will mention that. So um, the work we've done with this group of people has, uh, been, um, uh, has, has produced a report in three volumes, and it's not just on the slides, it's also a real thing, <laughs> a few kilograms of paper. Um, and I would like to, uh, uh, to share this with you, so perhaps you could have a look um, during my talk. Um, 
the, the manifesto is much lighter uh, and also easier to, uh, to find. Um, this is uh, also a company, there has been a, a movie that has been done around this work and around this idea, so I encourage you to have a look also at the movie. It has been uh, shown uh, earlier this week at USPI, um, and so it's um, actually the, the director of this movie is partly Brazilian, so it's uh, almost uh, close to home. Uh, so this group was uh, made of uh, more than 300 people involved in various roles, but uh, about 260 authors uh, did this, uh, this report. We tried to gather people from all the relevant social uh, science disciplines and also some of the humanities like philosophy, history, and etc. And, um, and, and people from all the, uh, the continents of the world. So, uh, we had more than 40 countries involved, um, and including a few, uh, a few Brazilian colleagues. Um, I wanted to uh, show you the address of the website. You can find on our uh, website, ipsp.org, a lot of information uh, about the drafts of the, the text and also videos of the authors, various uh, things, including teaching material. So uh, people have been using this report for teaching. For instance, it can be useful. We hope it will also, of course, be useful for people who are on the action side and not just the teaching side. Um, very quickly, who was involved? So I said many people, but the main name, so we, Amartya Sen has uh, kindly accepted to chair our advisory committee, and we had a scientific council with uh, people from different disciplines, so the political scientist Nancy Fraser, Ravi Combo, the economist, and the sociologist Elga Novotny. We had a steering committee, and uh, Olivier Bois and myself have been not, not leading the steering committee, but somehow being more active in it. Um, we try to be as egalitarian as possible in the organization and various institutions. So I'll, I'll go quick on this to focus more on the content of this work. So the objectives of this group were motivated by the historical juncture in which we are, which probably gives us a special responsibility to uh, make a contribution to the evolution of society nowadays. So we wanted to uh, really provide a comprehensive coverage of the uh, multiple issues at stake and the multiple dimensions of social progress, make social science more accessible to people, and we are, um, as Neka was saying earlier, we are no longer looking for magical solutions. We are looking for more pragmatic ways of thinking. Uh, and indeed, uh, this is what we uh, try to convey in this report, um, looking at real uh, solutions that can be uh, adapted to various local contexts. And um, we hope that we will uh, inspire uh, social actors and, and all citizens potentially um, with ideas about possible futures. Um, and also we hope that perhaps researchers will be influenced by this kind of work because researchers sometimes tend to focus more on the past or the present and not so much, it's a bit daring to look at the far future, to look at the long-term evolution of society. It's not so popular in social research and we think it is actually important given that we probably need to have a better vision of where we are going if we want to be able uh, to, um, to go in the right direction. So what are the topics of the report? So the, the answer that I uh, usually make jokingly is that every topic is covered in the report, um, every important topic you might think of. So the, um, the three volumes uh, go like this. So we have, in the beginning, we have um, a chapter discussing the long-term trends and another chapter discussing the definition of social progress. So it was not obvious to refer to the notion of progress uh, in this group because this is a notion which is fraught and controversial. But we thought it was important to um, really accept the fact that we cannot be neutral about the direction that society is, is, uh, is taking. Um, so we have to think in terms of uh, what are the values uh, that are worth promoting and being uh, be transparent about, about these. Um, so the first volume of the report focuses on the socio-economic transformations, um, so looking at inequalities, at the issues uh, about the environment, sustainability, but also about, for instance, cities. The urban development is something that will be crucial in this century, especially in emerging and developing economies. The future of labor, which is um, uh, something that is uh, quite important in the context of uh, uh, globalization, but also the new technological wave with automation and systemic questions about the future of capitalism, the future of the welfare state. We have a second volume, which is about um, governance, political issues, uh, the way things are decided. So we have uh, chapters on global governance and chapters of national governance, and the question of protecting the rule of law, expanding democracy. And one important chapter 
on the media. Uh, and now this is something that everyone is aware of. The media have a strong role, and not just the media, but the social media. Uh, so this is really part of the democratic nexus, what happens with the media and social media, and so it's very important to, to look at that in detail. And the third volume of the report is about transformations in values and cultures, which are also very important. It's not just the economy and politics that matter, but also the, the deep trends in people's uh, values. And so we look at the notion of modernities, modernities, uh, because we have different evolutions across the world. Uh, there is a chapter on religion, which is still uh, uh, something that plays a big role in many countries uh, in the world. And we have a chapter on families, because families are a key social unit where everyone grow, grows and, and, uh, and, and gets uh, strong support to start life. Uh, we have a chapter on health, and health is not just important for public health issues, but also for uh, the way we view life, because now with technical progress in healthcare, we see life in different ways. So we have more control over many things that happen to us, and this is changing the way we perceive life. And, and we have uh, a lot of uh, thoughts in the report about belonging, uh, the way we relate to one another, social cohesion, and these sort of issues. And finally, the report concludes with, with a few um, uh, highlights on uh, transformative ideas that can be uh, tested. So what I will uh, do in the remaining time is to um, uh, develop this a little bit and uh, we'll see how it goes. I, I will talk a little bit about the manifesto if I have the time as well and perhaps a little bit also about, um, about the, the last topics I mentioned earlier. Okay, so um, one quick uh, thing about the method of this group. So this group was very much interdisciplinary. We had uh, about the same proportion of economists, sociologists, political scientists, um, and we had other disciplines, um, as I said, philosophy, history, uh, and, and a lot of, I mean, a few people from psychology and anthropology and so on. Um, and so the way we managed to work across disciplines was to focus on topics rather than approaches, right? So of course everyone wants to defend his own discipline, but the idea was forget about what you want to defend, look at the topic, and try to bring something to the analysis of this topic. And that's how we organized the work. And every chapter, every uh, topic in the, in the report had a chapter which was organized uh, with a, a particular team, a separate team, which has these this different disciplines selected around the, the, the need for uh, competence around this topic. And we had two principles that guided our work. One was, uh, of course, there are many disagreements, and especially perhaps more in social sciences than in every other kind of uh, scientific discipline. Um, so the goal was not to agree on everything. The goal was to agree on the state of the art in the debates and in academia. Uh, so agree to disagree with the principle. So if you, if you can't find an agreement about analyzing an issue, at least you should agree about what is the state of the debate. That was the idea. And, and finally, um, unlike many other panels which refrain from giving recommendations, we uh, asked our authors to make recommendations, to make proposals for policy actions, not just for policymakers, but for all sorts of actors. Civil society is also very important. Um, and but the problem was with the recommendations is that when you are an expert and you give a recommendation, who are you? I mean, on what authority do you rely to give a recommendation? And so the idea here was not to, uh, to try to smuggle uh, values um, uh, across our expertise, but to be transparent and say, um, we give conditional recommendations, conditional on certain values and goals that uh, people may, uh, may endorse or not, right? So the, uh, this kind of recommendation says, if you have this goal, then we believe that you would pursue this goal in the best way if you follow this line of action. So that's, that's the idea, okay? All right, so let me now uh, dive uh, into the, uh, the main uh, messages and the main points of the report. So the first uh, key thing is that we are, as I said, at a historical juncture where we have a great responsibility. And why that? Well, because a lot of amazing achievements have been done since especially the middle of the last century. After this large, this big uh, world war, a lot of progress has been done. Uh, economic development, progress along uh, the uh, line of health, um, uh, longevity. Also progress in institutions. The number of democracies in the world has improved considerably. We now have about half of the population of the world and half of the countries of the world are living in a regime which is uh, rather democratic. Um, and uh, also progress in, in uh, values or so cultural inclusiveness in the sense that now 
compared to three generations ago, people are much more um, respectful of different races, different genders, uh, in, in also sexual orientation, and also have a different view of our place in nature, much more respectful of other species, for instance. So all these uh, developments are good. So we are somehow at the peak of our possibilities at the level of humanity, but we are facing an abyss. We are facing a chasm uh, because things can unravel. We can have uh, really big catastrophes coming from various looming <coughs> threats. And so among these threats, um, I would like to list uh, development gaps which remain important. So some countries are left behind. The situation in Latin America is not great compared to uh, some other parts of the world. Uh, there is some sort of economic stagnation in the last uh, decades. Um, but uh, the most worrisome situation in terms of development gap is the situation of Africa. Uh, and so in the next century, I mean in this century uh, and the coming decades, uh, we really have to hope that Africa will, uh, will find a way out of its uh, situation because otherwise uh, that is uh, potentially a big problem for the, the whole world. Um, but it's not just a development gap across uh, between countries, it's also within countries. Many countries have seen increasing inequalities. It's not so much the case in Latin America where actually uh, some policies in the last decade have managed to decrease inequality somewhat, even if it remains uh, high. Um, but we have a lot of countries where inequalities have increased and this is uh, creating social uh, social uh, strife, social crisis. And this translates into a crisis in politics. So we have this um, uh, emergence of uh, identity politics, uh, xenophobia, and populism in uh, many parts of the world. Um, and this is something that is partly linked to, uh, to this evolution in society. Um, another um, thing I have to mention is the migration problem, which is, in terms of numbers, uh, still not so big. It's about 3%, 3.5% of uh, people in the world are migrants which is a small number as such. Um, and, and most of these people are actually uh, not in the countries that are closing their borders. Uh, they are actually close to the areas of crisis. Um, but, uh, but this is a problem that may increase with uh, the climate uh, damages, uh, with uh, various conflicts. Uh, we may have uh, and more migrants, and I was talking about Africa. If Africa doesn't solve its development problem quickly, uh, we may really have a, a very big problem there. Um, so environmental threats, I already mentioned this. This is something that is, um, that is uh, indeed very worrisome on many fronts, and climate change is just one of them. And, and these uh, various threats are very worrisome, not just because each of them is important, but because there are feedback loops between them. And so this graph illustrates a little bit some of these loops. Um, so inequalities tend to uh, feed capture and corruption in institutions, and this uh, leads to a lower level of trust in societies, um, a breakdown in cooperation, uh, not just between countries, but also within societies. Um, and all of these phenomena also undermine uh, constructive policies, for instance, in, for the uh, environment, but also for uh, social cohesion. So you have arrows that uh, lead from, uh, from this to uh, inequalities, but also from environmental damage. Um, and um, environmental damages are also creating inequalities on their own because uh, the damages are spread unequally, but they can also trigger new forms of conflicts or uh, yeah, uh, uh, heighten, heighten the, the risk of conflicts in certain areas. Um, and migrations are fed both by environmental damage, uh, so we'll have more and more climate migrants, um, but also by, um, uh, by conflict and, and inequalities. So development gaps are also feeding that. And migrations are creating crises in certain countries um, and all that. So all these arrows, each of them are, are somehow is, is a small thing. But if you put all of that together, uh, that gives you a potentially explosive situation. So that's the, the situation in which we are. So what can we do about it? The first, as I said, we are talking about social progress, so this is not exactly a neutral approach. Um, and here the values on which we think we can um, flesh out, what, uh, with which we, we, we can flesh out the notion of progress, are these um, various values which are here on the slide. And you see there are many of them, actually it's a selection in the chapter in our report, we have 21 values, and we say 21 values for the 21st century. 
Um, and so let me briefly mention, so dignity is a key thing, basic rights, democracy, the rule of law, pluralism, uh, well-being, freedom, non-alienation, which has to do with not feeling completely separated from the others, uh, solidarity, esteem, and recognition. Cultural goods also have uh, their importance, and environmental values uh, beyond just the well-being of, of human beings uh, are, are potentially important as well, and uh, distributive justice, transparency, accountability. So this is a selection of the values, but you see, uh, we don't want to have a dogmatic definition of progress. We only think that <clears throat> all of these values are values which can be um, appealing to many people, and we can try to work around these values to see how we can promote them. So we have to, <clears throat> we have to work with the, the presence of uh, key drivers uh, which influence what we can do, and globalization and technological change are such uh, drivers. But too often, we tend to consider them to be external forces, and we have to adapt to them. In fact, we shape these forces. Policies, institutions uh, do shape these forces, so they have to be tamed um, uh, through various uh, uh, policies and uh, adaptation um, uh, measures. And um, one way to think about what happened with globalization is if we take inspiration from the work of Karl Polanyi is to say that somehow globalization has uh, free the market from the constraint of society because the, the previous world was a world in which at the national level you had institutions and economic activities were taking place within the institutional frame that was uh, defined at the national level. Globalization has freed many uh, economic actors from these constraints because now they operate beyond borders. They operate at a higher level and somehow they become stronger than many states. Um, if you look at uh, the 100 stronger economic institutions in the world in terms of revenue, you find 60 firms and 40 states, right? So firms now are, are um, at a, a somewhat higher level than many states. Um, and so we need to re-embed, and this expression comes from Polanyi, we need to re-embed market institutions in new forms, new mechanisms of social protection. Um, and this is, uh, this is a daunting task, but let me try to give a few ideas about that. Um, a key question that remains almost uh, like an open question in the report is, who will, uh, who will be uh, an actor of progress in this context? And actually, this is something that is not easy to answer. Um, and I guess um, we were right to leave it open because it's, we are in a very complex situation. So first thing to say is that, in fact, there still remains a lot of possibilities for domestic policy, national economic policies and social policies to do things and to especially prevent the rise of inequalities and reduce inequalities. So that's, that's still possible. And the proof of that is in the great variety of uh, policies that we do observe across the world. Especially if you look at, for instance, just the reduction of inequalities between uh, pre-tax and transfer incomes, the, the market incomes, and the post-tax and transfer incomes, the reduction of inequality is uh, vastly different across countries. In some countries, the Gini coefficient, which is a standard measure of inequalities, is reduced by up to 20 points, which is a lot. And in other countries, it is not reduced at all. Um, and so really, there is a lot of vari variety. And if there is variety, it proves that it's not true that globalization is constraining every country to do the same as the others. But um, in order to... Uh, to promote uh, the social progress and equality, uh, it seems that we need bottom-up action. So we can't hope for uh, top-down direction uh, at the national or at the world level to do it by itself. We need more and more pressure from, uh, from society, and that's where uh, civil society has a big role to play. Unfortunately, civil society is now becoming more complex than it was in the previous century. Uh, there used to be a strong Actors, obvious actors, people were looking at political parties, churches, uh, unions, things like that. These institutions are now much weaker. And so what we see is an emergence of new actors, many NGOs, many informal uh, movements, uh, associations, but things which are sometimes very, very informal. Uh, if you look at, I'm French, and so if you look at the Yellow Vest movement in France, it's a movement that is amazing because there, are, there is no leadership, uh, there, is, there is no organization, it's, it's very informal. So you have more and more movements like that. And so we no longer have any salient agent of change, but we have 
have a multitude of initiatives and somehow we have to think about how to make these initiatives coalesce and create, create something like a movement. And finally, a last point I want to mention is international cooperation remains uh, important and unfortunately is not doing very well nowadays. But again, um, it should not be just international cooperation between states. Um, we need also bottom-up uh, pressure there. And so probably a promising direction is international uh, cooperation and coordination across civil society organizations, across initiatives coming from, from civil society. Um, let me say a few words a bit more in detail uh, about socioeconomic issues. So um, we tend to think of inequalities as something that is tackled by, um, uh, by redistribution, by uh, taxes, transfers. Um, but in fact, uh, there are policies which can play a big role before the redistributive system operates, before taxes and transfers. And so these are sometimes called pre-distribution uh, pre-distribution policies, um, but this, and they are actually, uh, there are various types of, of this. And so when we think of the market economy producing these market incomes, actually you can uh, change what people bring to the market themselves. So that's uh, what happens before the market. And education is the main example. If you prepare people with education, then they are stronger and they can contribute to the market and get good incomes. Uh, also, healthcare is somehow protecting people, is helping people to be strong in their economic activities. So these are pre-market actions in a way, preparing people. But also something that sometimes people think of, of, of less is uh, in-market action. So we can also change the rules of the game in the market. And uh, to give you an example, we've seen a lot of market concentration uh, lately in many countries. And so this market concentration is, uh, is not good for inequalities. And so we should uh, do more to preserve competition. Versus. But uh, another example of in-market policy is minimum wages. That is also something that can play a role. But I'll say, I'll give you an, another example later in this slide, which is about the cooperation. Um, one key question that is um, a source of anxiety for many people is what about the future of labor? Is labor going to disappear with the, all these robots uh, that will uh, replace uh, workers? Well, the number of robots, active robots in the world today is around 3 million, which is very small compared to the number of workers. So that's not a big, a big number. But if you look at the curve of robots, it's an exponential curve. So it's a curve that really has this shape. And so when you look at the beginning of the curve, it looks, oh, it's so still small, but a few years or decades later, then it becomes really big. So we might be on the verge of a big transformation. We might be, but our authors in our group uh, are not seeing the disappearance of labor anytime soon, though, right? So um, what will happen is more a restructuration of the composition of jobs. And the problem is not so much the disappearance of labor, the problem is the pace of change in the composition of jobs, which will affect people because people who are my age, for instance, if they lose their job, it may be very difficult for them to adapt, uh, to find new skills and to go to completely different jobs. And so that's uh, the difficulty. Many people will have their careers seriously disrupted. Um, and we see uh, a problem with, for instance, the uh, emergence of the gig economy, right? So Uber and all these, uh, these activities where people are um, apparently independent, but in fact not so independent. And in fact, um, uh, they depend from uh, one platform uh, quite substantially, and their social protection is very weak. And so we have to somehow formalize uh, all, these, uh, all these informal sectors. We have the traditional informal sector in many, uh, in many less developed countries, um, and so we need to uh, work towards formalizing that. But we have now a re-emergence of informal work uh, through all these gig economy, uh, these gig jobs. And again, an effort in formalizing that is, uh, is underway, but needs to be uh, accelerated. Um, the Scandinavian model, I was, I was saying a few words about that later, uh, earlier, sorry, in the beginning. Uh, the Scandinavian model is, is taken very seriously by, by uh, our report. Um, it is sometimes downplayed by um, people who say, okay, this works for Scandinavia, it cannot work for other uh, countries. It is not an exportable uh, model. It works only in small countries which are very homogeneous in terms of populations. Uh, so there are very specific aspects of Scandinavia that make this work there, great for them, but not good for us. Um, and so um, 
In fact, the, the, we should look uh, more at how the Scandinavian model works. And it's a very interesting model, especially in the context of the globalized economy. It, has, it is compatible with a, an open economy. Um, it is uh, uh, organized around a centralized form of bargaining, so social uh, bargaining between uh, the representatives of workers and uh, businesses. Um, and it is uh, something that protects people, but not jobs. So that's the flex security uh, or flex security uh, idea. Um, and it is um, uh, managing the evolution of wages in a way that is good for the economy in, in, in many ways. So wage compression reduces inequalities across sectors, across firms, across skills. Um, and this is uh, reducing the need for redistribution. But it also helps um, improve productivity because when everyone needs to pay, every firm needs to pay good wages, it's impossible to continue working with uh, backward technology. And so that is something that is uh, promoting uh, uh, productivity. And the last uh, characteristic of the Scandinavian model is that is many programs are universal. And this is something that is important because everybody is on board. Everybody stands to benefit from these universal programs, and this is very good. A last point I want to uh, highlight regarding socioeconomic issues is the importance of businesses, what happens in businesses. Um, so people tend to focus a bit too much on when we talk about the evolution of society on this binary debate between the market and the government. But in fact, what is very important for people's um, situation in the economy, but also in society for their social status is what happens in their workplace. Um, and so uh, what happens in businesses, and especially in the, in the classical capitalist corporation, is extremely important. And we need to uh, reform the corporation. We need to reform the way businesses are run. Um, and that is uh, not a small task because the shareholder value model, which has been very influential in Anglo-Saxon countries, has spread over the world and is not a good direction. So we need to realign uh, business firms with society, with uh, uh, the common good. And that means changing the mission, the purpose of the corporation, of the businesses, and changing their governance at the same time. Um, and that means um, really uh, improving the uh, inclusion of stakeholders in, um, in the um, organization of, of the firm. And that is, if we do that, it's not something that is part of the Scandinavian model. And we believe that it goes deeper than the Scandinavian model because it changes, it somehow brings the uh, bargaining idea down to the level of every shop floor, every, every firm. Uh, and that is uh, quite important. So it's somehow a decentralized version of economic democracy compared to what we have in the Scandinavian model. So we are not dogmatic about how this should be done. Uh, many firms can do it in different ways. And uh, we, we are seeing, we are envisioning an ecosystem of different firms that can take different forms. So it's not just cooperative, for instance, we have now an emergence of a movement of benefit corporations. Uh, that comes from the US, but it's spreading over the world. Uh, these are firms that satisfy certain criteria and define their purpose, not around profit for shareholders, but uh, around a more uh, general uh, social goal. Uh, and this is really uh, spreading quickly now. So there are many good initiatives like that. Let me now go to the second volume of the report. So <laughs> I'm trying to make one slide per, per volume, which is uh, quite a daunting task. Um, so the, um, the, the, the governance issue is, I would say, is really central. It's not just central in our, it's the second volume of our report, so it's central in the report. But it's really essential, because if we want to think of improving things, we have to think in terms of uh, how to do it, how to change the way decisions are taken, and that's the governance issue, right? So somehow this is absolutely essential. And here we have, and I, I, I won't, uh, I don't have to, uh, I guess, uh, argue a long time here about the fact that there is a strong interaction between the health of society and the health of the political system. So if you have strong inequalities, you very quickly have a capture of the political system. Um, you have a very, very quickly uh, various forms of corruption um, that can really uh, undermine the democratic aspect of, of governance. And so we need to have healthy politics for a healthy society and a healthy society for healthy politics. Um, one thing that I've learned from the report, from the work of my colleagues, is that Latin America has been a fantastic lab of social innovation, uh, when inspiring a lot of imitation in the world. 
especially along the line of, of uh, participation. Um, and so this is about changing our vision of democracy from a sort of flat vision where it's just about electoral competition and free uh, access to uh, electoral uh, offices. Um, so democracy is much deeper than that. Democracy has to do with people being involved in decisions with, which affect them. And political theorists are moving very clearly now in this direction in their analysis of democracy. And somehow the practice of that has been experienced in many parts of the world, but Latin America in particular has been really on the forefront of this kind of uh, experimentation. So if I had to summarize the whole report in terms of what, what is the vision of a good future society, uh, I would say, uh, but that's my reading. I'm not sure every colleague would agree with that, but my reading is that uh, the vision that emerges is the future of society is a participatory society. That's, that's where we should be going. Um, as I said, the uh, media system is very important. Media and social media system is, is a sort of common good. Um, and we should treat it as such. We should not treat it as an ordinary business. Um, and we should not treat it as uh, something that should be controlled by the state. It's much too important for that. And so we need to find ways to uh, control the quality and the governance um, and, and the funding of uh, media and social media system. We are now, you know, in a lot of discussions about social media and how to organize them. We cannot leave it to, uh, to Facebook. We cannot leave it to governments. Um, and so again, that's where perhaps civil society can play an important role. And we do see initiatives. If we think of Facebook, there are initiatives coming from civil society trying to uh, track fake news, to track uh, false, uh, false uh, groups, uh, false identities um, that appear on, on such platforms. Uh, so these initiatives are actually very helpful, and civil society can probably play a big role there. Um, global governance is a, is a tricky issue. We know that um, global multilateralism is, is now uh, somehow uh, falling apart uh, under the pressure of the Trump administration in particular. But um, there are important issues about how to deal with transnational corporations, uh, which are much too powerful in the current situation, and the international organizations, which are not powerful enough. <laughs> uh, that's the opposite situation. So uh, it would be important to um, improve the standing of international organizations in order to give them more clout, more influence on policy making at the world level, and uh, to make them more accountable and more, more receptive to the needs of the populations uh, they, they affect. So, um, of course, um, some of these organizations like the IMF and the World Bank have had a controversial role in the past. Uh, they have evolved a lot. Um, but uh, we need to have uh, really a, a lot of thinking about how to make them more representative of the whole world. Uh, they should be less dominated by the rich countries, but they should be more somehow more powerful perhaps and also redirected, for instance, uh, instead of focusing on just development issues, they should now, we, have, we should have more focus on uh, managing the global commons, the global public goods like, um, like the climate, the environment and migration issues and all that. So we, we need, a lot of things there. And uh, that's uh, where uh, the question of civil society may be uh, relevant. So I already said civil society has a big role to play. Uh, so we should think of it as um, a new pillar that should really have a, a, an established role in democratic institutions. So we have the executive, the legislative, the judiciary. We should have something like that, a similar importance for civil society. Um, and, and so um, this is true at the national level. It should be true probably at the international level as well. And this is something where we don't see enough. Um, there are a few international uh, uh, NGOs, um, but, um, but, but, but not enough. And what we need is not, we don't need um, completely detached uh, helicopter and uh, international NGOs. We need things which come from the, uh, from the, the, the base, from every country. Every, uh, every local organization should, uh, should be connected to a global network, and that is a lot of work to do. I think this is very promising. Um, one question uh, that I want to mention briefly is the question of the, um, the um, I, was, I was checking the clock over there, but I see it's not a clock actually, it's moving in, the, in various ways. Okay, so I should, I should not be too, <laughs> too long. Um, 
the, uh, the future of the nation state is, is an interesting question because the nation state is, is, is um, now um, under pressure with globalization. Uh, at the same time, it remains the natural unit of, of democratic organization, of democratic debate. Uh, so people still um, identify very much to their nation state. And so how to think of, of that? Uh, this is uh, this is full of questions. So we are not going toward the world government anytime soon, and this is probably not a good idea either. Even though we need, as I said, more power in the international organizations. Um, so yeah, uh, let me leave it as a question mark here. Um, so let me say a few words about the the last volume, which is the last but not the least on cultures and and values. Um, we have there. Uh, the um, uh, study of, of modernization, which is interesting because um, the, the, the report is about progress, but certainly not about the vision of progress that comes from the 18th century. So it's not a linear vision of progress, and it is certainly not the idea that all the world should converge toward the leading, uh, the, the path that has been led by the developed world, by the rich world, and I would say by the white male. Okay, so this is not at all uh, the idea. Uh, the idea is more that you have an evolution of cultures uh, across the world, and this evolution is leading toward multiple visions of uh, the modernity, uh, multiple modernities. Uh, but it's quite interesting to see that this evolution across the world, which is taking different paths, is actually leading towards something that is uh, neither the Western model nor any kind of model. It is leading towards something that is nevertheless a sort of converging idea. And what is this converging idea? Let me take a risk. I see this converging idea as it is not written in the report directly, but somehow it is the idea of more respect, greater inclusion, so somehow um, a more democratic vision um, of, of uh, the standing of uh, human beings, different categories of people, and also different species, so the human species among other species. So a lot of a more horizontal vision of the world than, um, than used to be. So that's probably where we are converging. Um, uh, belonging, solidarity, uh, feeling part of the group is something that is important. So a lot of individualism is uh, now um, uh, seen as, as a problem in many countries. Uh, but in fact, people are still uh, social animals. We are still looking for belonging. And so we have to uh, really give um, people ways to, uh, to, f to, f uh, to do that and to, to, to feel that they are part of the group. Uh, that is very important for, uh, for, uh, human, for mental health and, and human development. Um, identity politics, I, I mentioned it along populism as something that is leading to problems. Identity politics has also sometimes had a progressive role. So uh, there are some oppressed groups that can rely on identity politics to defend themselves. So this is a complex, uh, the complex issue. Similarly, the religious, the, the group, the, the role of religious uh, groups is also very complex, sometimes very progressive, sometimes very problematic. Um, and so we, we can't just say religion is good or bad in terms of social progress. Uh, it can be anything. Um, and what the authors propose is to think in terms of constructive partnership. So we shouldn't imagine that the state or organization civil society organizations should just uh, clash with religious groups or should uh, become completely enmeshed with them, uh, but some form of partnerships can be very useful in some cases, and we can, we can talk about examples later. Um, as I said, um, the ideological clash between the market and the government is forgetting that uh, what happens in the business firm is very important. Similarly, the family is also a very important social institution. It is not a private, just a pure private thing. It is a social unit and it has a very strong role. And public policies can influence what happens in, in the, in the um, uh, in, in the family. So especially we see that parental leave policies um, and, and policies around childcare, elderly care can play a big role, especially in reducing inequalities uh, across genders uh, for around the division of tasks in, in the family. Um, health is uh, an important aspect because it's not just about uh, giving people human capital or protecting their human capital, but also about how it shapes their lives, how it shapes inequalities in society, and how it affects their values about, about different aspects of, uh, of what's important for a human being. 
I won't say much more about that, but I want to say a bit more about education because this is the topic of this, uh, of this uh, seminar, um, of these two days, and we have a chapter on it, and this chapter has been co-led by Simon Schwarzman, who, who was uh, uh, someone who was part of this institution here, so it's very close to, to, uh, to this house, so to speak. Um, and so this chapter is, is quite interesting in looking at the richness of the dimensions of, of education. Um, and somehow uh, it's easy to say if we, if we have a good education system, it solves all the problems. Uh, the problem is that education is the mirror of society. So the educational system is the mirror of the society in which it is. And so if you have a very unequal society, it's almost impossible to have a, 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 an equalizing um, an equalizing educational system, right? So it's um, so we cannot imagine solving everything through education. Unfortunately, uh, it is part of the of the nexus that creates or reduces inequalities. Um, Education has, has many roles, so it's not just about preparing people for, a, for their economic role, so giving people human capital. It's also about uh, shaping their view of life in general, so it has a humanistic uh, role. It also has a role in shaping, in, in uh, uh, training them to be good citizens. And it has a big role in terms of uh, shaping social uh, roles, uh, so giving people um, uh, access to uh, less, unequal, uh, less unequal positions. As you know, the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals about education, are unlikely to be achieved. And even in spite of uh, substantial progress, uh, we are probably not going to succeed uh, fully. And uh, especially in terms of secondary education, we are probably uh, being, uh, will be, uh, will be way behind uh, the goals. Um, there are important debates which are discussed in the in the report about the returns to education. So, should we invest more in early child education or in uh, in tertiary in higher education? This is something that is debated and is very actually hard to decide. Uh, so, I won't try to uh, give you my opinion on this. It's it's a it's a hot debate. Uh, there is uh, an important discussion about uh, the uh, strategic aspect of teacher training and teacher uh, status. Uh, so the, the countries where you see that the educational system is very healthy uh, are countries where teachers of a high status are very well trained. Um, there is also um, a section on pedagogy and curriculum which are so the content of education and the methods are important. And here, interestingly, I was talking about participation and Latin America as a, a sort of lab for that. This is mentioned also in the education uh, chapter, uh, among other chapters. Uh, so uh, the idea of learner-centered education and some forms of participation um, are, are important. Um, and so uh, this, is, um, uh, this is something that is another example where participation is, is important. It can, um, so children who benefit from this kind of education are given a training for becoming good citizens uh, also. That, that is uh, very promising. Um, at the same time, the, the report is cautious about certain forms of uh, decentralization which may uh, which may be harmful, uh, for instance, if they allow for heterogeneity uh, across uh, what the children get from the educational system. And the role of teachers' union can be good or bad depending on the situation. So there are examples where it can actually protect uh, teachers who are not well trained, and, and that may be harmful. And in other cases, it's actually very good because it promotes a participatory uh, organization of, of the educational system. Um, so I will. Um, I will conclude uh, very soon about this um, uh, presentation of the, of the report by saying that um, there is the question of where we are going in terms of as a society. So what is the next system, right? If, if I want to be broad, bold in, in asking this question. Um, so there are a few innovations that are discussed in the report, like the universal basic income, uh, like uh, drawing uh, representatives by lot, right? The sortition idea is you draw people by lot, and you could have a, a chamber of uh, uh, people who would be not elected, by, but drawn by lot. Um, that has some virtues and some difficulties. And I already mentioned the governance of the corporation and the issue of workplace democracy, which is uh, an important, um, an important uh, uh, direction. Um, as I said, we should go beyond the capitalism-socialism contest and pay attention to businesses and families, so I can go quick on that. And finally, um, uh, as I insisted on participation, um, we, we need to really think of it as something that is not just about politics, but about um, deepening democracy in all aspects of society, including families, including businesses, 
including global governance. Um, and we need also to think of uh, future generations as people who are not, do not have a seat at the table. So we need to find ways to represent their interest in a more uh, conspicuous way in our decisions. Uh, somehow we, we need to make the future generations participate in our decisions. And that is not so, not so obvious. So um, I am only at the first uh, third of my slide. Uh, so th let me stop here. Uh, this is the uh, structure of the little book uh, that is, um, that is uh, quicker to read than the, the report, where we discuss some of these promising ideas. Uh, let me leave it here, um, and we flesh out some of these, uh, especially these uh, directions of uh, reforms for um, the, the cooperation, capitalism, the welfare state, and changing, uh, changing politics. Let me stop here so that we have time for a discussion. Thank you very much. Obrigada, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Um, eu, eu tenho algumas perguntas, a gente vai abrir para perguntas agora, eu vou começar com algumas e depois a gente abre para perguntas do público. É, e a gente tem microfones, acho que rodando por aí, para vocês poderem fazer perguntas. Mas eu queria começar com uma. Você tocou nisso na sua apresentação, isso aparece no relatório também. É, sobre essa a dupla democracia e desigualdade, ou democracia e igualdade. O Brasil viveu um período de redemocratização recente, a gente onde a gente viu um aumento da participação, a gente teve, pelo menos até então, a estruturação, a ampliação de conselhos participativos, a gente teve um fortalecimento da sociedade civil, indiscutivelmente, a gente teve a gente tem é, um, instituições que bem ou mal funcionam, a gente tem eleições democráticas né, há muito tempo no Brasil, e, no entanto, a gente tem também níveis é, absurdos de desigualdade que se manifestam de maneiras muito diferentes. Então, a gente tem taxas de homicídio, por exemplo, elevadíssimas, que afetam uma parcela específica da população, sobretudo os jovens negros. A gente tem uma concentração de renda ainda muito grande no Brasil. A gente tem cidades que é, desenham centro e periferia de forma que as oportunidades estão muito desigualmente distribuídas. Isso criou no Brasil uma ideia de que a democracia e, desigualdade, e desigualdades profundas podiam conviver. Eu queria que você elaborasse um pouco mais como você acha que a desigualdade ameaça a democracia, se você acha que ela, de fato, ameaça a democracia. Yes, it does. And um, one example is, for instance, the power of money in money, the power of money in politics. Um, because um, we see that, for instance, in Brazil, it used to be the case that politics was mostly funded by big corporations, um, and that is not something that is healthy. We do have this problem in the US still, so a decision of the Supreme Court has said that uh, companies should have the right to fund not political campaigns directly, but uh, political communication operations. Um, and so that is distorting the political process a lot. Um, and so inequalities are, uh, when you have strong inequalities in resources, you do have the constitution of oligarchies, of, of uh, the, the capture of the main spheres of power, by, uh, by the wealthiest uh, the people and corporations and families. And that is something that is not healthy. So it can, it can work for some time, uh, but it, it's uh, not, in the long run, it is not very healthy. Aproveitando que você... <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, aproveitando que você trouxe o tema do poder, é, é, e ele aparece também retratado no, no, no relatório, Sociedades muito desiguais, elas têm, ela tem também uma concentração de poder muito grande, eu não estou falando só de poder político, mas também de poder econômico. É, no seu trabalho, você também advoga que é, a igualdade ou a redução das desigualdades ela, ela é um tema para o campo da justiça social, então devemos advogar por ela porque a gente tem que falar de justiça social, mas ela é, um, é também um tema da eficiência do Estado, das empresas. No entanto, essa desigualdade que a gente vê no Brasil é, de poder político e de poder econômico é uma desigualdade que cria uma sociedade de privilégios. É, como convencer pessoas que estão, que têm o poder de transformar, que têm um poder grande de transformação, mas que vivem numa sociedade de privilégios, de que a redução da desigualdade lhes interessa também? Como engajar é, essas pessoas, essa parcela da sociedade? 
Yeah, I wish I had the answer to this question. Um, we wished. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is, that is indeed the, the key problem, right? We need to find a coalition of, of people who accept that the, their long-run interest. I think in the long run, indeed, it is in the interest of everybody that society is healthy. Um, but how to convince people who are here and now in a privileged situation uh, that they should abandon some of this for something that is long run and very uncertain, very hard. Um, so that's why um, this idea that civil society has a role to play is interesting, right? Because um, the main um, political parties uh, in many countries, the trade unions are now very weak. So uh, we need to find new ways of uh, organizing the pressure from, uh, from people, right? So that um, uh, it's not just about enlightened, privileged people realizing that they need to share their privileges with everyone. It's also uh, the pressure coming from, uh, from the bottom-up pressure that needs to, uh, to be uh, there. And that is uh, the key thing. Without, without bottom-up pressure, I don't think we'll have uh, any serious evolution. Obrigada. Eu vou fazer uma última pergunta, depois a gente abre para a plateia, depois a gente volta. É, a gente tem no Brasil uma discussão que é antiga, mas é, se acentuou durante o debate eleitoral, é uma discussão que opõe igualdade de oportunidades e meritocracia. É, e no Brasil a gente faz essa discussão como se essas duas categorias fossem excludentes. Ou você é alguém que tem que apostar é, na meritocracia e ela é o único jeito de explicar... É, como uma sociedade se estrutura, enfim, ou você é alguém que tem que pensar na chave da igualdade de oportunidade. Você acha que é possível conjugar? Isso acaba, eu acho que uma das consequências da minha interpretação é que você acaba criando é, é, discussões absolutamente estanques. As pessoas não se falam, você impossibilita o debate nesse sentido. Você acha que é possível conjugar essas duas categorias, pensar em igualdade de oportunidades e meritocracia conjuntamente? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the debate is, is somehow uh, moot in a way, uh, because um, when you look at the long-term evolution of society, uh, the opportunities of one generation are very strongly linked to the uh, outcomes of the previous generation. And so if you allow, uh, if you have a very meritocratic society where you allow for strong inequalities in outcomes, it's very hard, almost impossible, to have meritocracy at the next generation level, right? They will inherit the, the uh, high inequalities of outcomes of the previous generation. And so, um, so meritocracy is, uh, is something actually that was, is now viewed positively by many people. But when it was introduced initially, it was as a criticism of the evolution of society toward uh, high inequalities according to certain personal characteristics of the people, things like talent or skills or, or things like that. Um, and so we need to be careful about, uh, about the, the dark side of meritocracy and the fact that it is, um, it is not, um, uh, it, it is somehow self-contradictory because if we allow uh, huge uh, inequalities in outcomes, uh, we are undermining uh, any sort of practical uh, meritocracy. Uh, so somehow, let's be cautious about that. And roughly speaking, I would say uh, equality, reducing inequalities in outcomes uh, is, uh, is more uh, promising than just focusing on opportunities. And we can say perhaps more about the details of the difficulties of measuring opportunities and all that, but um, yeah, that in, in a few words, that's the main point. Eu vou abrir para algumas perguntas da plateia. É, acho que tem microfones. Se vocês puderem é, levantar a mão e se identificar, a gente vai fazer blocos de pergunta. Eu pedi para que vocês fizessem perguntas sucintas para que várias pessoas possam perguntar. Então, e se você pudesse apresentar também, por favor. Tudo bem. É, bom dia. É, eu sou o Vitor, de Minas Gerais, da Federal de Ouro Preto. É, gostaria de perguntar para o professor... Uh, que ele falou uma parte da educação, e acho que para o Brasil isso é bastante válido, que a educação de um país é o reflexo, é um espelho da sociedade daquele país. Né? E, e para o Brasil, que a gente tem uma sociedade bastante desigual, a nossa educação reflete isso. Mas aqui a gente está num seminário discutindo o poder da, da educação como né, democracia, educação e equidade como uma força transformadora. E eu acho que os exemplos que são muito mencionados são dos países que conseguiram fazer uma rápida transformação por meio também da educação. Acho que as coisas 
progridem, né? usando a palavra do progresso que está no relatório, elas progridem juntas. Uh, e aí é muito mencionado aqui é, Coreia do Sul, Singapura e Finlândia, que pouca gente lembra que, no início do século XIX, uh, século XX até, era bem pobre. Uh, então, é esse poder transformador da educação que a gente... Eu acho que todo mundo aqui está um pouco em busca, assim, como é que a sociedade faz para chegar lá. Só me apresentando, eu sou pesquisador do Centro de Estudos da Necrópole, é, da Universidade de São Paulo. É, é bem é uma questão um pouco mais geral sobre a ideia do, do painel e do manifesto. A minha pergunta, no fundo, seria qual é o papel do cientista e do filósofo em relação em uma sociedade democrática e em relação à deliberação democrática. É, como que podem cientistas e filó filósofos, em geral, né? É, deliberarem conjuntamente, pensarem conjuntamente com o cidadão, com os demais cidadãos, sem serem paternalistas ou, perfeccion... ou aderirem a doutrinas perfeccionistas, dado que vivemos numa sociedade plural com, com valores morais é, diversos. É, e, por, e, por fim, se não, não tem uma tensão intrínseca entre a tarefa do cientista e filósofo quando ele vem a público como advocacy porque, no limite, aí tem que transformar a evidência em algo absoluto, o que, por definição, na filosofia e na própria ciência, é, não é. Muito obrigado. Obrigada. Eu queria só uh, me juntar a essa pergunta, porque eu acho que é um tema que aparece na pesquisa que foi realizada também pela Fundação de Setúbal e, e aparece na pesquisa da Esther Solano, que ela fez anteriormente, é justamente uma percepção de que há uma desconexão entre a universidade e o debate público, uma desconexão entre a formulação que é feita hoje na universidade e as necessidades que a política pública e que as pessoas no seu dia a dia têm também. E eu acho que o painel ele, ele afirma a direção justamente contrária. Okay, so first about education. So you are totally right that education is important, and I, I did not mean to say that education is only the consequence of society. Actually, as, as I said, it's a, it's really uh, uh, something with a strong feedback loop in both directions. Um, actually, if you look at what happened in Brazil and in Latin America in the last decades, up until two years ago or three years ago, um, the reduction of inequalities that has been impressive, about five points of the Gini coefficient, that is uh, really something that is impressive, was in part due to progresses in education that uh, d d decreased the, uh, the, uh, the wage gap between different skill levels. So that was a, a key element. So you see, indeed, it proves that education can play a big role. Um, and, um, and there are various, I mean, this is true uh, here, but in other countries, for instance, if you look at Africa, education of girls is also extremely important for other aspects like the demographic transition. Uh, so th there are, education is indeed a key, uh, a key element, and I didn't want to downplay it on the contrary. Um, but on the other hand, I wanted to warn against the illusion that uh, we can solve all the problems of society through education, right? So somehow, unfortunately, it doesn't work as simply as that. Why that? Well, simply because uh, the elites are always able to tweak the, the, the educational system to their advantage, to, to keep the, the privileges they have for their children through Uh, through the uh, somehow manipulating the system. So, so that's the situation we are in. And I, I come from a country which had this ideal of the Republican elitism, which was supposed to be totally blind to social inequalities and really promoting talented uh, ch children. But in, in, instead of that, it reproduces privileges and it, it really, it's a very unequal system, right? So that's the difficulty we have to face. Um, yes, yeah, so the role of, of, the, uh, of the expert or the philosopher or whatever, the economist, uh, who said that the economists are the most important people in the long run, but um, the, yeah, so this is a key question we, we had to ask ourselves, and I didn't mention it in, the, in my presentation, but the very last chapter of the report is actually not the one I mentioned about the, uh, uh, the transformative ideas. It, there is one after that, uh, the 22nd chapter, which is about the role of experts in policy making and in, in transformations of society. And this is a sobering chapter because the role of experts has been sometimes positive, sometimes very negative. Um, and so the, the key question for us, I think, is um, um, indeed part of our motivation was uh, how can we improve the level of the public debate, because we, we are frustrated that um, a lot of things we have the impression we know 
are not widespread in society, and there are still stupid ideas that are uh, very common in public debate. So part of our idea was to, uh, to try to convey, to make the academic corpus uh, more accessible through this report and, and, and all of that. Um, that's one thing, but it's not just that. I think we also now are, as I said, we, we have our generation as a historical responsibility because we can continue the progress we've done or we can uh, go toward uh, 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 above a cliff and, and toward uh, very large catastrophes. And so um, in this context, what is the specific role of uh, academics, of researchers, of experts, right? Uh, what should they do? Um, so I don't have the answer to this question, but what we are trying to do uh, through this collective work is to uh, somehow um, give people, so not just give people material, for food for thought, um, and sharing some uh, academic corpus, but also um, trying to work ourselves around building a vision for a positive future. Um, so when we... When you look at uh, the work in psychology about what motivates people for action, uh, people are not really motivated by fear. If you just frighten people, uh, that doesn't produce constructive outcomes. It can motivate people in the, in the bad direction, and actually polit uh, populist politicians, uh, they rely on fear a lot. That's the, the feeling they try to trigger in people. But, um, but that's not what we want to uh, use the, if we want to motivate people to do something constructive. And so what we try to do in this work is to propose a vision. If people have a, a positive um, uh, a, an encouraging uh, vision for the future, that's where they can find momentum and energy. Um, so that, that's what we've tried to do. Is that sufficient? I don't know, right? So what, what is really the responsibility of uh, academics in the current situation? Um, should we stop doing research and go into politics because the situation is so dire? I don't know, uh, but yeah, we are in a really uh, crucial period of history and uh, I'm not sure what we should do. Pela, just to tell you, we had Nessas eleições no Brasil, a gente teve alguns professores universitários de áreas totalmente da matemática, da arqueologia, que se candidataram, uh, saíram candidatos a deputado federal. Então, acho que tem também uma tem uma reflexão acontecendo hoje, também justa aqui no Brasil, sobre qual é o papel da academia, seja na produção do conhecimento, seja em, entrando na política mesmo. A minha pergunta é referente a uma questão que eu tenho enfrentado todos os dias, que é a participação, o protagonismo dos movimentos camponeses, dos movimentos quilombolas e dos movimentos indígenas na construção de uma proposta de educação para os seus territórios. E, dentro da Unesp, nós conseguimos criar um mestrado em desenvolvimento territorial na América Latina e Caribe, mas enfrentamos a resistência da universidade em aceitar esse protagonismo dessas pessoas é, e, por outro lado, também uma resistência do governo, que o atual governo, por exemplo, eliminou todas as políticas de bolsas que nós tínhamos. Né? Então, eu queria que você comentasse é, qual a razão dessa resistência que faz que tanto a universidade quanto o governo vê isso como um certo privilégio, enquanto, na verdade, eu digo o privilégio dessas pessoas chegarem à universidade, né? enquanto, na verdade, nós vemos como os direitos dessas pessoas. A minha pergunta vai muito no, do meu lugar de fala enquanto cientista social, mas também enquanto assessora parlamentar e ativista política. É, esse, em relação de democracia com desigualdade, eu acho que o Brasil passa por um momento muito difícil, mas as eleições de 2018 trouxeram um pouco de esperança, apesar de toda a turbulência política. Porque, gostando ou não, houve renovação política. O que, que isso significa? Você comentou em uma fala sua é, que qual que é o principal problema da democracia com a desigualdade? É que grupos é, econômicos que concentram basicamente boa parcela de, de recursos financeiros acabam dominando o poder político. E a gente teve, na, pela primeira vez na história do Brasil, exe diversos exemplos de campanhas com poucos recursos que conseguiram é, um, um super alcance, engajamento, e diversas pessoas se elegeram dessa maneira, desde para cargos executivos quanto legislativos. E dessas pessoas que se elegeram, tem pessoas com uma agenda muito conservadora, que é, de fato, a agenda majoritária hoje, que está sendo pautada no Congresso e nas outras assembleias, mas também tem muita gente 
com um pensamento mais progressista, preocupado com a questão das desigualdades, de promoção de justiça social. E essas pessoas têm uma responsabilidade muito grande, que é a de tentar fazer com que as pessoas não desistam de acreditar no poder de transformação da democracia. E aí a minha pergunta é se você tem alguns exemplos inspiradores de políticas públicas que já estão impactando e diminuindo as desigualdades em outros países e em outras regiões. Um, so on the um, issue of um, of including, um, uh, I hope I, I fully understood the question about including uh, 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 various uh, populations, especially minorities or, or uh, uh, native populations, uh, in in the higher education. That was the idea, right? And how to to make this more accessible to them. Yeah. So one. So I fully agree with you. I'm not sure uh, there was any any uh, real question I could answer there, but I, I think. Um, One difficulty, apart from the, the resistance from established uh, interest, um, who sometimes are very, uh, and that's that's something that's hard to understand sometimes, but they are very uh, hostile to uh, the development of certain parts of the population. Uh, so th that's something myself I, I, I don't fully uh, understand in terms of the psychology of it. But um, when when you have strong inequalities, uh, that's something we didn't talk about yet. But um, it's not just that people are further apart in terms of the standards of living or the degree of power they have. It's also that they feel less connected to one another and f they feel less empathy and it can go even toward they feel hatred toward the other parts of society. And so what we seem to be observing in certain countries, and this is more like casual observation than statistics, uh, but I heard several from several sources that in fact the elites now, uh, which are really disconnected because they have reached so high levels of uh, living standards, power, and um, somehow they live beyond borders, right, compared to the people who are remain in, in, uh, in very traditional forms of life. Um, these elites now feel hatred toward the rest of, uh, of society, and that, that is most bizarre, but, but that can explain sometimes why you have this, uh, these very hostile reactions against forms of development coming from, uh, from, from uh, bottom-up initiatives. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention very briefly is one key question also which is hard is the issue of uh, this idea of multiple modernities. So it's not just across countries, but it's also within countries when you have multicultural uh, groups, um, how to respect the various cultures and try to, what's interesting about this co-evolution of cultures is that we can learn from, from the various cultures. And these native uh, populations, they have their traditions, they have some ideas which can be very helpful. So I, as I was saying, we are not converging toward the ideal of the, the, the thing that was set by the white male, right, dominating the world. We are, not, we are not at all doing that. And in fact, what we are seeing is that the Western model, uh, the white male especially, but even all the, <laughs> all the Western uh, people, they, are, they have to learn something. And they have to learn that their place in the world is not dominating everything. And they, their place as a human beings is not dominating other species. And especially in Latin America, it's very interesting, this idea of uh, our place in nature has been, was viewed very differently by the native populations than the, the uh, Western uh, traditions. And that is something we can learn from them. Uh, and, and we are seeing this evolution. So it's fascinating that the young generations in the, in the developed world, in the rich world, uh, now they are moving in the direction of, of the native uh, cultures. So it's, uh, it's really moving in all directions. So that, that's very fascinating. So how can that be translated into, uh, into uh, a curriculum uh, in higher education and research in a way that really makes the most of these various cultures? That's hard to do in practice, but we should think in this direction. Um, Regarding the, the second question, um, so, yeah, it was a broad question, so I'm not quite sure in what direction I should go, but it's true that it's uh, very interesting to think in terms of the role of money in politics. I mean, that's one example of, you, you mentioned the fact that some, um, some uh, political um, uh, movements or candidates were able to do things without having much money. So the role of money in politics is really essential, and finding ways To, um, uh, to, to handle that is, is very important. So the goal should not be uh, to get money out of politics. Uh, it should not be that. Why? Because you need money for politics anyway. You cannot do politics without money, right? So the, we should really think of the role of money in politics as something that has to be handled like the role of money in any sort of common good that we are, uh, that we are cherishing. 
And so the, the health of the political system is something that should be treated as a common good because a healthy political system is good for everyone. And so we should treat that and the funding of, this, uh, of the political activities, that's the problem of funding a public good. So how do we do that? Well, um, again, it's a bit like the media system, and it's actually a part of this question. Um, just relying on public funding may not be the, uh, the best way because public funding can be uh, distorted, can be manipulated in certain ways. And we see in some countries that public funding of, uh, for instance in Russia, public funding, it's mostly public, so political activities are publicly funded. And, well, no wonder, it's funded in a way that advantages the party in place, right? And so it's, it's not, so you cannot trust the state to do that in the right way. So how to do it? Again, Perhaps civil society has a role to play in finding ways to, uh, to handle the role of money in politics. So enhancing transparency, where does the money come from for various activities? So a civil society can help in understanding that. But also a civil society can be a source of funding. So we can have crowdfunding for many political activities. And actually a lot of countries have this sort of crowdfunding system, even the US somehow has rules about crowdfunding and you have you cannot give more than a certain amount of money if you are a certain category of person. So this kind of rule is needed, um, but it needs to be much stricter than, than it is implemented in many cases. So I'm not sure I'm, I'm really giving you uh, the, the kind of answers you were, you were hoping because I'm just uh, jumping on one particular aspect of, of, uh, that you mentioned, but handling money in politics is, is very important. But it's just one aspect of many other things. So to give you another example, very quickly, um, one thing that is really um, undermining the health of the political system is stupid, if I may say, stupid electoral rules. So you have, in many countries, you have rules which um, are irrational in the sense of producing a selection of candidates that doesn't really reflect uh, the preferences of the electorate. And so we need to innovate, and there are, uh, res there are researches about how to find better uh, electoral rules which reflect the preferences uh, of, the, of the electorate in a better way. I mean, this is another example of things which can, uh, which can uh, innovate um, on the status quo. Yeah, again, not sure I'm fully answering the question. I want to for more I want to make one no final da sua apresentação, você trouxe alguns elementos da, do relatório, você falou em respeito, inclusão, horizontalidade e você falou também das políticas identitárias. A gente tem no Brasil hoje dados que mostram de maneira muito contundente a vulnerabilidade de alguns grupos em particular. Então, vulnerabilidade de mulheres, de negros, de jovens. E, no entanto, ainda há muita resistência aqui é, no Brasil na formulação de políticas de ação afirmativa ou do reconhecimento da necessidade da gente olhar para essa diversidade e ter políticas específicas focadas para esses grupos. Como você interpreta é, essa, essa, na verdade, essa tensão entre dados que mostram a vulnerabilidade é, de grupos em particular, com a dificuldade da sociedade, as, enfim, reconhecer a importância de políticas de ação afirmativa, reconhecer a, afirmação, a necessidade de reconhecer essa diversidade? e promover essa inclusão é, de forma mais diversa? Um, yeah, so the, these vulnerable groups um, are uh, part of their vulnerability is that they have um, little access to voice and to power. And so somehow this creates a vicious circle. Um, and so how do we get out of this? So the tension you are describing somehow is... so. I'm, so you know, affirmative action policies are debated, so they may have some uh, backfiring consequences, but on the whole, I guess, probably uh, we can say they, they have a positive impact. Um, but the key question is um, how to uh, get these vulnerable groups out of their vulnerable situation, right? And it's not just about um, uh, giving them a specific uh, targeted aid or support, uh, it's about really making them part of the mainstream, so to speak, right? Party, and so uh, el eliminating their sources of vulnerability. Um, and so um, I'm not sure um, I have much more to say about that than uh, that it's really um, uh, important to think of ways of, of giving them um, access to participation, access to, to power, and 
becoming themselves the source of their own emancipation, right? So it's, uh, it's not just about uh, giving them special clutches or support, uh, artificial support that will uh, somehow help them. It's about um, making them no longer special groups. Uh, because, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's a bit crazy when we think of, we talk about women as if it was a minority group. Well, it's more than half of the population, or it's about half. So it's a bit strange, right? So, so we have, we have uh, really, we should really completely mainstream these issues and not see these groups as special groups. Uh, they are, they should be just uh, collections of people, and each of them uh, should be part of uh, the mechanisms having access to voice and power and all of that. I'm not sure it's the, the answer you were hoping. No, for. Eu acho, uh, uh, I would like just to. Porque assim, a gente continua falando das mulheres como uma minoria quando elas não são, mas, e eu concordo com você, e o mesmo acontece com os negros no Brasil. É, por outro lado, a gente, o Estado é incapaz ainda de é, prover políticas que façam com que as mulheres, de fato, expressem o seu lugar como não minoria. Então, a gente não tem políticas hoje, por exemplo, é, de uma assistência à maternidade ou licença à maternidade. As mulheres hoje sofrem muito impacto de ter filhos. E, no entanto, essa particularidade não é plenamente reconhecida pela sociedade. Então, eu acho que existe um acordo de que as pessoas têm que ter a sua própria voz e se emanciparem, mas como a gente chega lá se a gente tem uma sociedade que resiste em reconhecer essa vulnerabilidade? Yes. Okay, that's again the same problem. Where where do we start uh, unraveling the uh, the nexus of vested interests and entrenched inequalities? Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. So again, that's where. Um, uh, civil society and initi bottom-up initiatives can play a big role. Take the Me Too movement, for instance. The Me Too movement is a bit weird because it started from elite people, I guess actresses and people in Hollywood kind of universe, so it's not exactly a bottom-up movement, but it became a bottom-up movement very quickly. Um, and so this kind of movement can shape, uh, can, sorry, can transform the, uh, the, the debate and uh, the vision that people have of various categories of people, sometimes very quickly, right? So, but uh, you need, what is myster mysterious about uh, these movements is that you don't know where, why at some point they become very momentous, very powerful. Uh, why now and not before? Uh, why here and not there? Uh, that's, we don't have a theory for that. But sometimes, I mean, somehow these movements emerge and do sh uh, change things. Uh, so, we, yeah, so every, um, it's a bit like the Rosa Parks moment for civil rights in the US, right? So you have why this person was more influential than other people who did the same thing at other places, other times. Uh, yeah, some things are more influential than others, but we need, we need a lot of these things and some of them ultimately become uh, powerful. É, muito obrigada, professor Florbe. A gente tem que acabar agora. A gente tem uma outra sessão. Então, para quem não conseguiu fazer as perguntas agora, a gente tem uma outra sessão onde essas perguntas podem voltar. Queria agradecer ao professor, queria agradecer a vocês. Queria agradecer à Fundação de Setúbal, ao INSPER e à Unesco por terem trazido esse debate para a gente. É tão oportuno e tão inspirador. Obrigada. E voltamos às 11h30 para a próxima sessão. 11h30, 11 voltamos. Muito obrigada.